progress. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. The uh, Pacific Coast Archaeological Society's meeting has uh, Dr. James Sneed. The title of his talk is Relic Hunters, Archaeology and the Public in 19th Century America. James Sneed is professor of anthropology and curator of the archaeological repository at California State University in Northridge. He received his BA in anthropology at Beloit College, followed by an MA and PhD at UCLA. He has been awarded grants from the American Philosophical Society, the Werner, Glenn, uh, Werner Grin Foundation, and the National Science Foundation. Research interests include the history of archaeology, ancient roads, and the history and, and the historical archaeology of the American West post-1850. His current writing project is Mothers of American Archaeology, Women, Preservation, and Heritage in the Western United States from 1890 to 1920. Everybody, please give a warm welcome to Dr. James Sneed. It's all yours. Thanks so much. And I, shall I say that um, following Megan's exhortation to uh, regarding the fellowships, I sent, uh, I forwarded you all's message to my department chair, and she immediately posted it. So we are, you know, we're we're we're, we're trying. I was a little slow on the ball on that, but um, but we're we're trying to make up for it and see if we can get some applications because it's a it's a huge service, and we. We're, we're grateful to PCS for making that those that those funds possible, available, and let's see if we can get some people to actually act for them, which would be a, even better. All right, so let me let me bring this up here. Let me see if we're actually. Now I may do this a different way because it's for some reason the. Um, no, PowerPoint gets a little cranky if we, all right, I'll try it like this. Share this. We will go to presentation here. All right, how's that look? Are we, are we, are we in? That would be. That's perfect on our side. Looks good here too. So uh, just a couple of words of, of general background. Um, I. I appreciated Joe's invitation um, and interest in this particular subject. Uh, and I came about this in a sort of a, a roundabout kind of way. I, I grew up in New Mexico. I'm, a, I'm not exactly a native, native New Mexican, but I, I, for all intents and purposes, that's, that's all that I remember. And I, Santa Fe in the 60s and 70s was a, a marvelous place to, to grow up in. And of course, as, as many of us are aware, it's very, I mean, you can't throw a rock in that town that hitting an archaeologist. So I, you know, I, I learned a lot about, about archaeology sort of via osmosis for just, just being there in town. And I was thus rather surprised when I got to graduate school that to learn that many of the things that I had heard or learned or deemed important um, in, in, on the local level in, in, in archaeology didn't really rise to, to the attention of the, the academic um, world. And that the, the people who were teaching us all the things that, that I thought I was learning as a, as a young person were, were irrelevant. And we can unpack that in a variety of ways, but what it the the influence that that had on me was to to send me to to the archives, and thus periodically, while you know my my day job is as an archaeologist and I teach archaeology classes and I do archaeological research, I am I find the history of the discipline to be to be compelling and to be I think poorly understood. By, by a lot of my colleagues. And so every few years, I find myself delving back into archival sources for a variety of ways and um, trying to understand what it is that we do when, where it comes from. I mean, what, what's the, 
what is it about archaeology, particularly in the United States, um, that distinguishes it from a lot of other kinds of activities? And, and parenthetically, why is it that archaeologists themselves don't necessarily embrace this 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 legacy, this this history? And uh, that's a general statement, and, and lots of us do in our own way. But but there's there's something there about the history of archaeology that that has always been compelling to me. And and so I you know when I when I get funding and the opportunity, I, I do some research and I, I publish some things. So it was Joe pointed out um, that that my my recent my recent book in 2018, which was that goes by the same title as this lecture, Relic Hunters, Archaeology and the Public in 19th Century America, which was made possible by a variety of, of fellowships, one from the American Antiquarian Society, funding from the Winter Grant Foundation for Anthropological Research, and a couple of strategically placed um, grants from, from deans and colleges and things in my, my place of employment. But this gave me the funding gave me the opportunity to go to places um, that were not easily accessible and make use of their resources. I was, I was told by a senior colleague once many years ago that if I really wanted to have opinions about, I don't know, um, 19th century mounds and mound excavations and things, <laughs> that I really had to go and go to the source and look it up. So the funding um, in this, for this project made that possible. And in the book that Emmers grapples with some of the related issues. So it's, uh, and I'll say this that, and maybe someone in the room will, will remember this that this is not the first time that I've spoken to PCAF about kind of a historical topic. And so when I was setting this particular lecture up, I had to go back and, and, and do a little research about what I had said to you guys, um, you know, 10 years ago to make sure I wasn't boring anybody in the room, but also to see that I was, was sort of consistent in the kinds of things that I, that I brought to, to people's attention. So, so that's, um, that was, that was kind of fun, actually, because I, it, it allowed me to package some, some things in ways that uh, were a little bit different than I might have done just off the cuff or might have done with my, some things I do with my students. So, so with your, with your uh, forbearance, let's, um, let's get into it. Also, I should say that um, I'm, I'm going to have plenty of time at the end for questions. I, I, I really appreciate questions and comments. If something occurs to people while I'm babbling on up here and you, you don't want to interrupt me, um, just pop it into the chat just to hold it as a you know something we can remember. So, in addition to any questions that we have, you know, um, voice to voice at the end of this, all we can go back to chat too and see if there's anything there that people thought of on the on route and we can address them um, at the end as well. So the fundamental divergence that I see in histories of American archeology span by and large is that they're essentially what one might call top down histories. They are, they're disciplinary histories written by, you know, by people like me, um, who are particularly concerned with uh, what happened to, to lead us to, to where we are today, to, to basically to lay the foundations for, for the things that are familiar to, to, to all of us in this, in this, um, in this virtual presentation. Uh, and I see that as kind of a top-down approach. It's a history of the profession. Um, it's often a history of people in the path who who we think um, you know, are, are worthwhile ancestors in a way, people who sort of or, or sort of got, got it you know, as we see archaeology in advance of, 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 the, of modern times. Um, and that's 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 completely understandable because, because we need worthy ancestors to understand where we are. But I think it's fundamentally incorrect. And um, I'll I'll I've spent much of my, my career as a historian of archaeology um, trying to trying to make the case that in fact by by looking from looking at ourselves top down from the people who are sort of exemplary intellectual and understood things and, and, and laid the foundation for what's become that we're we're, we're 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 telling a story that's only interesting to ourselves um, and that in fact a more 
accurate, but maybe more meaningful look at what we do today and the origins of where we are is to flip it and to look at archaeology from the bottom up or from, from the grassroots, if you, if you like. Uh, and to make that case, let me just simply make a couple of, of generic points here about what archaeology would have looked like effectively 200 years ago. So if we are to imagine where this activity, this discipline came from, and what its foundations were in, say, 1800, 1850, it might be relevant to imagine an archaeology with no national institutions, no Smithsonian, um, no National Park Service, no uh, a state historic preservation offices, no archaeological infrastructure whatsoever. N not only it not only didn't it exist, um, but there was no understanding that it, that it ought to exist. I mean, it's no rationale for for anything of that sort at all in this period, although at the very, very end of it, the Smithsonian first shows up in the, in the late 1840s, but even that Smithsonian was not the one that we would recognize today. Um, imagine also an, a, an archeology span with no university courses or programs, nothing at all, um, no training, no understanding or um, you know, no, no curriculum for what one will have to learn to be an archeologist. Um, places like, like Harvard and Yale obviously existed, but what they taught and their interest in anything that resembled archaeology was radically different than, than what we might expect you know, today or in recent, recent, uh, recent decades. And given that also, no common understanding anywhere globally of how archaeology worked. I mean, how you could go from ancient bric-a-brac of one sort or another, how you could go from, you know, a, a, a ceramic vessel like I've got here on my desk to, um, to, to history, to understanding um, people's lives. I mean, the connection between material culture and things that literal, things that happened in the past had not been articulated in any way that was, that was shared. Uh, so, so in that case, what is archaeology at all in those circumstances? Uh, there were a few things that might might sort of glimmer at, at uh, might, might recognizable. What you can see in the image on the right is actually the, the headquarters of the American Philosophical Society, um, which had been established in the early 18th century and was a place where occasionally they would have discussions about things that, that would sound vaguely archaeological to us, but they would be intermixed with and discussions about meteorites or um, machines that um, harvested wheat faster than than previous things, or um, or you know why why swallows flew into the water or thing. You know, anything intellectual or, or scientific would be um, grist for the mill at a place like like this. So yeah, it's it's a national sort of national scientific organization. But what they talked about was, I think rather unfamiliar to what, what we might think of today, despite all this, despite all that. People living in the United States in the first half of the 19th century um, had a profound understanding of the cultural relevance of antiquity. I mean, there's uh, there are newspapers have articles about Pompeii and discoveries of later on, um, discoveries of uh, you know, ancient Assyria and relevance of the Stone Age and things like this, that, that the, the, the potential importance for, for the history of Euro-Americans um, that archeological discoveries might hold was, was widely understood and, and shared. At the same time, this, the community, the, the public, if you like, in, in the 19th century, early 19th century United States, um, was was aware of lots of evidence for archaeological discoveries here, like in the United States proper, and things like mounds and what they would call work and discoveries of all kinds were were discussed in a relatively frequent way in a variety of media um, national. So there's people they 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 thought about the relevance of antiquities. They understood that antiquities of a more 
um, perhaps mysterious and complex sort were to be found here in, in this new country that they, they were occupying. Um, connecting the, the two was not straightforward, but it was widely understood that there, that there was a, a connection. But above all, and this is, I think, one of my, my more, more, more fundamental points, there's a huge degree of public curiosity. And by that, I mean actually public curiosity, meaning that lots of people who weren't sitting here in the halls of the American Philosophical Society debating meteorites or what have you, um, people out you know, in a variety of places were aware of what we now would think of as Native American antiquity. And they were very curious about what to, what to do about it, what, how, how to use it, how to understand it, um, how to incorporate it into some broader discussion of, of, of history, Native American or not. So you, the, the interest and the depth and the curiosity is real, even though the infrastructure for pursuing that um, you know, didn't exist. So my own interest here in this, in this pursuit is uh, less about the building of the infrastructure that leads to us, leads to people like me with my you know, shelf of books behind us here, um, and more about the other, about the public, the, the depth of the public interest in American antiquity, Native American antiquity, um, and, and how that played, I think, an under appreciated role in, in what becomes American archaeology. So we leave Philadelphia, we leave the American Philosophical Society where, where you know, people debated these kinds of things and hop across the Appalachians um, into what we would now call the Midwest in Ohio and Kentucky. Which, which to us are basically east adjacent, right? The people in the West Coast, it's like, you know, you get to Ohio, you're almost, you're almost to the, the Atlantic. Of course, in the early 19th century, the, the Appalachians were a considerable barrier and that lots of people that we would like to think of as big interest in archeology, span Thomas Jefferson, for instance, um, never got west of the Appalachians, had no personal experience for what was out there in the, on, on the early 19th century frontier and what complicated archeological evidence was being encountered by people out on the frontier, got to them only via letters and communications and various kinds of ways from their, you know, their friends and relatives who were out there looking at it. So the image you can see on the right is a map of Sturkelville, Ohio, which uh, is, you know, uh, today is just a sort of a small county seat right in, back in the middle of the state. A uh, Circleville, Ohio was called Circleville because it was built in the middle of a Hopewell earthwork, what we would nowadays call a Hopewell earthwork with, uh, you know, with associated mounds and other enclosures and things. A remarkable archeological site that was also um, a little town that was the county seat of, uh, of a county in, in Ohio. People in Philadelphia thinking about archeology span never got to Circleville, but they learned about it through people who were out there making a living farming in Ohio and sending back these reports and memos and maps like this um, depicting these remarkable material remains of indigenous history in the American landscape. So the book is called Relic Hunters. And I, I, I actually was critiqued a little bit in the editorial process about using this term, um, but, but that's, that's a term that they would recognize themselves. I mean, they're um, individuals who, despite the fact that they, they had no formal sanction or no you know, no infrastructure, no, not much funding, um, who were out there on the frontier in a variety of places in the South and the Midwest, going further West as time goes on, um, who took a, 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 a detailed interest in these remains, artifacts, sites, all kinds of evidence reflecting a very rich and deep historical legacy of, of indigenous America. And 
in the course of our what I'll what I'll bring up here, I'll I'll refer to, to two or three different kind of nodes or for foci of uh, of of the, if these people would have recognized, and and one is a term um, that I that I tried to to make use of, which is antiquarian entrepreneurs. Um, and that basically reflects the idea that there were people on the frontier who were interested in archaeology, as we see it today, but nobody's funding them. They have no they, they have no outside support. And they're interested in figuring out ways that they can make antiquity work for them. Um, if they can be supported, they can be funded, if they can make a living somehow with this kind of complicated historical research that's plentiful out there um, and that people are interested in. And so somehow they need to make use of it in a way that can further their own ambition, if you like, in a context where they've got, you know, they're not professors, they're not unemployed to do this because no one will pay them, but they've got to live. And so how, how does that how does that work? So it's it's I use the term entrepreneur because they're 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 sort of scrambling at making a living at places like Circleville and uh and figuring out how to how to make it go. A second term that I, I will use and you'll see here would be antiquarian circles. And it, it's fairly consistently that there are places out on that early 19th century frontier where um like-minded individuals get together to talk about artifacts and sites and what have you and um you know and, and see what can be done with that right see what they can learn and again no infrastructure these aren't formal institutions really um but they're they're talking they're sharing information and they're they're learning from each other and and again trying to figure out what what to do with these these things that they're finding and they're hearing about um, and how they can contribute to general knowledge in this context. And the last term that, that you'll see come up, I'm going to use a couple of times, is what I call iconic artifacts. And that there are things, discoveries, locations, um, and actually artifacts that are become really significant in the discussion between these antiquarian entrepreneurs and the people back at back in Philadelphia and these other people thinking about them, there are, are, are widely acknowledged significant items that are debated. And in my discussion today, I'm going to talk about one of them in particular, uh, but the history of these iconic artifacts, their fate, if you like, I think closely tied into this whole question about, about you know, grassroots archaeology in, in the United States in the early 19th century. So I'll come back and forth on this more than more than once. So here's a quote that, um, that I will, I'm, I'm happy to test kind of sets the stage for this, right? That comes from, uh, whoops, let me get into that. Every time, every once in a while, I like to button here and it will not, here we go. This is a quote from uh, uh, sort of a Western polymath named Daniel Drake in 1820, referring to um, archaeological site, one of many. Uh, in this case, the, the map is of a place called the Old Stone Fort in Tennessee. Um, Daniel Drake said, you know, these monuments are our only antiquities, meaning the antiquities present in what is the United States. And although they may not like the classical ruins of Asia, of Asia and Europe, awaken inspiration nor infuse melancholy, it will not, I hope, be thought altogether unworthy of our admiration, unquote. Meaning, among other things, that all right, we don't know who who they whose history they reflect. Maybe it's native people, maybe it's somebody else. Um, no, it's not the Parthenon. Um, you know, we don't have a whole history. We're not really connected to these things, but they have value. They have value. And the challenge for someone like Daniel Drake is to articulate what that value might be. 
Drake is an interesting guy. Goldstone Fort is an interesting place. Um, I've never seen it, but I have cousins in Tennessee, and they tell me that if I come out there, they'll they'll take me. So uh, maybe maybe I'll a grant and go see it sometime. That would be that'd be a lot of fun. Maybe we'll do a field trip. How about that? All right. So let's talk about relic hunters. Let's talk about about archaeology in the United States at the beginning of the 19th century. The book itself covers a broader span. I mean, I, I really, I basically go all the way up to about 1880 in, in that. But rather than give you sort of a pre of the whole thing, uh, I would rather focus on one particular story from Relic Hunters that I think sort of encapsulates some of the, the complexities of the subject and maybe also its, its interest. So, um, so rather than give you the whole soup to nuts, we're going to talk about one particular case, and this would be the case of something that um, was known as the triune idol. So to my comment about iconic artifact, the triune idol um, was an iconic artifact of early 19th century American archaeology. And what I'll, what I'll talk through here um, is the story of the triune idol and maybe glean some, some lessons from, from that particular narrative. So, all right, the triune idol, which got its name in a curious way, which I'll discuss in a second, was discovered in somewhere in an archaeological site in the Cumberland Valley of Tennessee about 1815. And the, uh, the reason I'm, I suggested that particular date comes from, um, among other things, this a reference that you can see here, uh, which was um, written up in 1823 in an interesting book called sort of The Antiquities of Tennessee. It was a book about about archaeology, if you like, and it really puts some fascinating insights in here. And um, Haywood, the author of this, says, okay, in White County, Western Tennessee, someone a few years ago dug up uh, what he called a flagon, meaning a, a vessel, if you like, formed into the shape of three distinct and hollow heads, dot, 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 dot. And this would have come from uh, an archaeological site it would be now recognized and has been recognized as an artifact associated with, with the Mississippian culture, the well, term that we use um, in contemporary archaeology. So I don't know, um, we, could, we could delve into this more deeply, but it's essentially a thousand year old um, artifact vessel that we can, if you wanna go back to, to this image, that looks more or less like this. So three heads and a, Surrounding a a central a central basin, it's a it's a it's a, a a vase or that kind of a that kind of a vessel. So that's fine. Um, we don't know more about its discovery. We have no context at all. We know that it was not found by this gentleman's name is James Overton. Uh, certainly. Um, came into his possession. Overton was um, a Tennessee, a member of the Tennessee elite. He was uh, described by his medical students as, a, and, and I quote here, a small black eyed man, very hypochondrical and sarcastic, notoriously so, and yet quite chatty, humorous, and agreeable, telling his class many funny things when he was. Uh, associated with the medical school of a university or a college in Lexington, Kentucky in, in the 1810s and 20s. Uh, again, how he got this vessel, we're unclear, except that it's generally attributed to, to him and to an origin in, the, in you know, somewhere on the, on the Cumberland River in, in Tennessee. Well, all right. Now, Overton, was a member of what I would refer to as the Lexington Circle, in that it happened 
that in Lexington, Kentucky, in particularly sort of 1815 to 1820, there was a group of people who were um, quite interested in American antiquities and got together and talked about it and formed a kind of a node um, in the in a broader network of people who were interested in this sort of thing in um, in Ohio and Indiana, sort of adjacent adjacent area, and particularly um, in Kentucky. Um, James Overton was one of them. Another um, pair, if you like, were um, were Sarah Clifford and her brother John Clifford, who were well to do. Um, came from a well-to-do mer Philadelphia merchant family and found themselves um, running the family business in from Lexington. The, the painting of the Triune Idol itself was done by Sarah Clifford. So uh, it wasn't just sort of for you know men at this point. And, and you could argue, I think, and it should be done, that Sarah Clifford is one of the the very earliest, her, her, her painting of the Triune Idol, I, I, I held it in my hands, it's about, about that big, although it's painted on a piece of wood, um, is one of the very first indicators of the literal participation of women in American archaeology and should be celebrated, among other reasons, for, for that. So Sarah Clifford and her brother John Clifford um, held forth, this is actually a house that Sarah Clifford lived in, um, in her married life, she subsequently married a, a minister named named Ward and ran Ward's Female Academy in Lexington, which, among other things, and you'll start to see by my reference here how this kind of ramifies in different directions. Um, Mary Todd Lincoln, who well, the wife of Abraham Lincoln, was a student of Sarah Clifford's at Ward's Female Academy in, in Lexington. So the Clifford family and their associates, the people like Overton, um, were hooking interest in, in American antiquities. And this, you can imagine that Overton had this triune idol sitting in the middle of his dining table or on a mantelpiece or something. And they, and, and it, they became the focus of a lot of interest on their part. But because of the painting, because of that little image, which got circulated around, um, knowledge about this artifact became became more widely shared in their uh, sort of on the frontier and not so much elsewhere yet but at least at the beginning among their friends and associates i should also note that another element of the this lexington circle was the presence in lexington of transylvania university and my students always laugh when I talk about Transylvania University um, because of the obvious associations with Dracula and, and, and whatever and the actual European Transylvania. At this point, obviously, no one made the connection between vampires and Transylvania, at least not in the early 19th century United States. Um, Transylvania was and still is a significant educational institution in Lexington during this period, it was most known for its medical school, and many of the members of the Lexington Circle, with an interest in antiquities, were connected to, um, to Transylvania, to the medical school, which, which they had here. So Daniel Drake, who I quoted a few minutes ago, was on the faculty of Transylvania and interested, among others, in uh, American antiquities. The person that really sort of took um, uh, the deepest interest in the Triune Idol and gave it the name, the Triune Idol. The, the, the Cliffords called it the Treble Flagon, if you want to get into the, into the weeds on this, um, was a guy named Caleb Atwater. And Caleb Atwater was a postmaster in Circleville, Ohio. Um, had come from Connecticut and is often considered to be one of the real founders of, of uh of American archaeology because he actually got out and did a lot of archaeology himself, wrote a, a famous report, an archaeological survey of Ohio in 1820. But Caleb Atwater was immediately drawn to the potential significance of this artifact, this iconic artifact, that he designated the Triune Idol. And um, 
picking up on a point that that John Clifford had made, Caleb Atwater thought that this fairly conclusively meant that that the the whoever had made it ancestral Native Americans or you know they're they're still talking about this sort of mound builder mysterious group of people whoever had been Hindu because of the sort of triplicate the the triplicate kind of aspect of this thing and connecting to the to the Hindu Trimurti, um, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Um, it turns out that there were reports from the uh, the Asiatic Society of Bengal in the library of Transylvania University. And even though I don't know how you would make this clearly the case, it seems likely that somebody in the Lexington Circle had dipped in those reports and been reading about Hinduism and said, hey, uh, maybe this connects to our, our, our artifact, and we're now calling it Triune Idol, and it means that ancient Native Americans were, were Hindu, and they came from India, and that, you know, that accounts for their history. It's, this is challenging because Atwater did a lot of archaeology, mapped a lot of archaeological sites, went a lot of places, did some interesting things, and when he gets to conclusions, he goes right to the, the, the Triune Idol and sort of dumps all this actual archaeological work to the side because this seems to be, um, in his way of thinking and some others, that the clincher. There's no other suggestion is that ancient Native Americans were Hindus, but this one really, really makes, makes his case. He published the report, and the Triune Idol becomes relatively famous in among those who are interested in American archaeology, both in the Midwest and then also now out on the Eastern Seaboard. Well, uh, perhaps a final member of the Lexington Circle that's worth mentioning here is this rather uh, unfortunate looking gentleman whose name was Constantine Rafinesque. Uh, Rafinesque um, has inspired many sort of detailed uh, studies. Uh, he was a, a European immigrant. He had spent some time in Sicily. He knew the Clifford family and so came to the United States to be a naturalist and gravitated towards the, the Cliffords and came to Lexington and, and John Clifford got him a job at Transylvania. Um, Raffinesque was one of these sort of uh, slightly unhinged um, sort of polymath and naturalist who, who was constantly sort of uh, reinventing the wheel. The, there are many, um, Scientific names of fairly common animals, like the scientific name of the white-tailed deer in the eastern United States, was was uh, established by Raffinesque, not because he was the first person to see a white-tailed deer or even to, you know, evaluate it as a naturalist, but somehow he got the jump on everybody to actually give it a, a, a Linnaean name. Um, a, a complicated, interesting, and probably probably insane um, person, I would I would guess. Uh, but Raffinesque shows up in Lexington. The real thing happening in Lexington was archaeology. So he gets into archaeology too. So what you see on the right-hand side is the report that Raffinesque wrote on some archaeological sites, big enclosures, Hopewell probably, um, in, in Kentucky. And he would, he would go out and make little maps and write reports and bombard people with them in an effort to... Um, sort of an effort of self-aggrandizement, but also maybe to get a job and someone could actually employ him to, to do these kinds of things. Um, and while life in, in Lexington was interesting, it wasn't the same as Philadelphia, and he was constantly trying to get back there. So yet another antiquarian entrepreneur who's looking at archaeology to see if they can he can figure out a way to make it make it pay. So one of the twists um, in Raffinesque and in the Lexington Circle in general is that John Clifford dies young. He dies in 1820, probably of stomach cancer. Um, and when he dies, his collections become, um, up for, they go up for grabs, basically. And one of the interesting things about iconic artifacts is that they're, they're a kind of capital. They're a kind of... Uh, I mean, people who have them, you know, they're, they're desirable. They want them. And Raffinesque 
scrambles around um, and, and tries to figure out how he can turn the situation to his advantage. So um, he's, I mean, the, the, the estate, John Clifford's estate is inherited by Sarah Clifford Ward. Uh, but everybody around her is trying to figure out um, how to dispose of the collection in ways that might help them. So Raffinesque actually writes Thomas Jefferson and says, um, hey, um, the Clifford collection is remarkable. Um, and here I am in Lexington and I can get it for you, um, but only if you give me a job. So if you give me a job at the University of Virginia, um, President Jefferson, um, then, then I will make sure that the, all the cool stuff that we have out here on the frontier that, that was acquired by, by my, my late friend, as he says, John and Clifford, um, will come with me. And there, there's actually no evidence that Jefferson took this, this seriously. Um, but it does go to make the point that these artifacts were not simply intellectually interesting. If they were also possessing them um, had value and they had value on, on, on many different levels. And some people tried to leverage that value into opportunities for themselves. All right. So, and that's a, this is a, let me, let me, let me stop this discussion for a second and, and emphasize these points. So, uh, and we're looking again at, at Sarah Clifford's um, painting of the Triune Idol. So here you have, and I'm also checking the time to make sure I don't uh, don't uh, um, try your patience for, for too long. So all of this hubbub about this artifact, the, the discovery of the artifact, the evaluation of it, the publication of, uh, of the artifact and its potential meaning, and the, the value of the collection in terms of I mean, literally it's, it's, it's used for further analysis, but also it's, it's value on a cultural level, like the possessors of these things, um, you know, I mean, it's, a, it's valuable to display, to demonstrate to people that you know, there is interesting, useful, important things being discovered out here on the fringes of American society. All of this happens without um, the involvement, really, of those People, uh, you know, in the salons of Philadelphia and, and New York or Boston. I mean, it's all sort of internal ferment out here on the on the plains or on the plains on the on the, in the hinterlands in in Kentucky. Uh, they are reliant on those eastern institutions, the nascent institutions, for publicity and sometimes for funding and publication. But but there's a little rivalry there too, and that they're they're really sort of saying, look. Um, we're finding this cool stuff and we think you should be interested, but but it, it's ours, right? I mean, it, it, it's valuable for our, our own people here in this part of the world where everything is is brand new. At least we have no we have no deep historical associations, except that you know, that you know we find them here in the ground and there are mounds and ruins. And so there's a there's 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 value to this stuff for us. So yes, it's important to try to understand you know, where native people came from, et cetera, um, and deal with this thing about mound builders and da da da. But but we don't want to send it to you. We want to keep it because it's it's it, it it's ours. It, it it's something that we have discovered and is valuable to our own communities. So there are multiple levels, if you like, there to to try and, and understand, but um they're clearly in and the triune idol is only one one example of many other many other choices. But it's also important to follow it through, right? To say, okay, you know, now that it's been written up and painted and whatever, people have debated it. Next, what happens? What happens next? Okay, so what happens next is that um, the scene of action, for our purpose anyway, shifts from Lexington, Kentucky. Um, down the Ohio River a little ways on a on a steamboat or, a, or or however you're getting back and forth in 1820 to Cincinnati, which, as you can see in this 1820 map here, is already a fairly a prosperous city. It's bigger than Lexington and sort of one of the bigger bigger probably the biggest town in the along the Ohio during this time period, um, because in Lex or sorry in Cincinnati 
they are are also interested in Native American antiquities. And in fact, one of the earliest formal museums um, in the American West, if you like, is um, established in 1819, 1820. It's called the Western Museum. And one of the, um, the goals of the founders of the Western Museum is to collect as many local antiquities as possible not necessarily for their scientific merit, but to demonstrate the achievements of, uh, of Westerners, of Westerns. And so it's not about the content of scholarship, it's about the idea that scholarship is taking place at all out here um, on, on the frontier. It's seen as a, a local asset and let's, let's get the museum going. Let's have lectures, let's have collections, let's, um, let's demonstrate what we can do. And I. Um, to note that people like John James Audubon spends time at the Western Museum painting, you know, his famous pictures of of, uh, of birds. I mean, it's it's a it's a, a node of scholarly achievements way on the edge of 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 the United States, and that scholarship includes archaeology. So. Among the other characters that, that turn up on the frontier, one of the more interesting is um, a guy who in the early 1820s becomes the director or the proprietor of the Western Museum. His name is Joseph Dorfui. And I, I hope that's Dorfui. I have to ask somebody who reads French to pronounce that for me. Um, who may or may not have been the descendant of, of mm, French nobility. I mean, sometimes the name was spelled with an apostrophe like Dorfui um, to, to suggest that he's got, um, you know, sort of highfalutin ancestors. Um, he may in fact be from Mississippi or in maybe Louisiana, maybe New Orleans. We don't really know. His antecedents are, are mysterious. Um, but he was a collector and had, apparently had things like Egyptian antiquities, allegedly, in his collection. And he shows up in Cincinnati in about 1823 and ends up being the owning, buying the Western Museum. Um, by this time, the Western Museum, and, I, and his role in this may be, um, I think, probably pretty clear, ends up buying the Clifford Collection of Antiquities from Lexington. So, and that would have included the, um, the Triune Idol. So rather than it being sent to Virginia with Thomas Jefferson, it is bought by Cincinnati. And it's the occasion of much regret in Lexington. There's lots of like, editorials in, in the newspapers saying like, how come a wealthy patron of Lexington couldn't, couldn't buy these things so we can keep them here? Why are they going to Cincinnati? I mean, it's a, and that's a, a kind of a discussion that is not uncommon today, right? So Dorfui becomes the proprietor of the Western Museum brings his own collection of stuff, buys the collection from Lexington, and his museum would have been, you know, in the middle 1820s, a fairly significant um, holding point for American antiquities from all over the, from all over Kentucky and Tennessee and Ohio. It would have been a substantial and potentially interesting collection of artifacts. Uh, and that's all good and all, but as others have discovered, people don't necessarily come back to a museum multiple times to see a lot of ancient pottery, right? The, the public of, of Cincinnati, um, with, on whose patronage the museum was reliant, you know, were, you know didn't weren't really, um, didn't find a regular amusement or interest in a, in a whole bunch of archaeological artifacts. I mean, the case could be made, but you wouldn't go back multiple times to see even something so interesting as this triune idol. And so Dorfui and his associates spent a lot of time desperately trying to, uh, to keep the attraction, keep the interest of the Cincinnati public. So one of the people who helped with that was this guy, William Bird Powell. On the right hand side, you can see Powell's the cover page of his, the his doctoral thesis, which came from Transylvania University for the medical school. 
how was a phrenologist, um, one of these people that would be interested in sort of skull shape and size and bumps on the head. Um, and, and so he would come and give lectures on, on using um, using skulls. He showed up one time with the head of a famous murderer in a, in a glass jar that was quite exciting for a while. Um, Howell practiced what he preached. And apparently when he died, he donated his head to one of his students um, or maybe one of his uh, female friends, or maybe both, because the student and the female friend apparently got married later on, and, and I don't and I'm quite figured out what happened to, to Powell's head in the course of this. But his significance for our purposes is that, you know, visiting lecturer came to the museum and talked about things that included archaeology um, to help bring in, you know, bring in attraction to the to the uh, and keep money flowing um, to the coffers of uh, the museum to support their activities. Well, that that comes to a head um, in the 1830s when Dorfui hires uh, a young man whose name is Hiram Powers to help him create an attraction that is subsequently called referred to as um, the infernal region. Powers was a sort of a handy guy. He knew a lot about mechanical things and constructed in the, in the sort of upstairs of the Western Museum, constructed a kind of a clockwork hell, um, a kind of thing where you could sort of wind it up and let it go and there would be moans and groans and the backdrop was painted like you know, like a lake with souls boiling in, in, in the water, and and demons would rise up out of it. I, and apparently, it was quite the thing, quite the event. This term "infernal regions" um, you know pertains to that. And people all over Ohio used to go to the Western Museum not to necessarily see pottery, not necessarily for archaeological purposes. But to check out the infernal regions and and be be scared, right? To have a little a little um, you know inexpensive fright. Powers went on to become one of the most famous sculptor uh, sort of American sculptors of the nineteenth century. He was based in Rome for thirty years after this. I'm a famous guy in his own way, not interested in archaeology particularly, at least not as far as we know. Um, but his. Um, Creation, this infernal region, you know, kept the Western Museum running um, um, well late into the 1830s. Um, and in the background, you can imagine this in the background, in a glass case downstairs, kind of around the corner somewhere, when everybody's trooping by to go upstairs and be scared by, by demons and devils in this exhibit, they would have walked right by an exhibit case with uh, the Triune Idol in it and other artifacts, maybe a fossil or two. In other words, it's still there, but it's, you know, it's no, it's not, its significance is slowly sort of, um, sort of fading. Dorfui finally gives up on Cincinnati, um, packs everything up, and in the late 1830s, at least, at least we think he did, and this is an interesting question, uh, packs some of the stuff up and goes to New York City to uh, uh, establish an exhibit in a, thing called, a museum called the City Saloon. And there are hints, and you can see this article in one of the New York newspapers, there are hints of sort of drawings and maybe an artifact or two that he brought with him, probably just drawing, that he brought with him from Cincinnati that allude to the fact that this triune idol, this thing about vessels for drinking and Hindus and things here, um, you know, we think that the, that means the triune idol was still there um, in 1839 after almost 20 years in this museum in Cincinnati, um, but, but I would say very much at risk at this point. Um, this its significance is no longer really understood. People who thought it was valuable have mostly passed away or gone on, um, and, and yet Endorf Wee is desperately trying to find um, another gig, uh, and he dies very quickly, he gets consumption, dies in New York, um, and everything he brought with him is, is lost, and there's no accounting for it at all. He's, 
interesting to say kind of in passing that there's evidence and you can see it here um, from a couple of, of antiquaries in the 1840s. There is suggestions that Dorfui was trying to write a book about archeology. span And one can imagine that that book would have included information about this triune idol. I, I've seen a letter somewhere of someone about this time period who asked him for a cast of this, this vessel. So people knew about it. It was, it remained famous amongst the intellectuals who were interested in antiquities, even if on the ground, it was a little bit scarce. Um, but according to the word of the day, um, he died all, all right before this volume that he was working on was to be published. There are letters from his widow at, you know, trying to gin up some interest in this slight, almost finished volume, um, which apparently doesn't get published. And there is, again, no accounting of what happened to the plates that they mention here, to any of his commentary, to any of the content for this volume of the archaeology that had been available to those who were at the Cincinnati Museums in the 1830s. That's all, all gone. So coming perhaps to a conclusion here really quickly, what remains unknown is in fact, what happened to the Triune Idol or any of the other substantial number of uh, Hopewell and Mississippian artifacts that would have been in the collection of the, of the Western Museum, you know, for, for 15 or 20 years after they were acquired in the 1820s. Um, and there are, in fact, queries in the 1840s. Does anybody know what happened to, but um, even Sarah Ward is dead by this time. So no one remembers, no one knows. Um, once, I mean, there's always suggestions that the, the museum is always burned down after a couple of years. So the Western Museum, what was left of it, uh, burned at one point. So things may have been lost in that at that event. There was a major sort of a like almost like a fire sale in Cincinnati called the Western Sanitary Fair that was a, a fundraising effort during the, the Civil War. And there's a suggestion that all the remaining bits and pieces, bric-a-brac from the, the Western Museum ended up uh, getting sold off during the sanitary fair. Who knows, right? But it's important to, to, to acknowledge that as of now, 2023, we assume that everything that was in the Western Museum's collection, including um, iconic artifacts like the, um, the Triune Idol um, was, was lost by, by, by the time of the Civil War. So, I want to. I mean, I'm 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 beginning my wrap up here, but um, there's a, a useful quote from another early 19th century antiquary, again in Moses Fisk, who was um, lived in rural Tennessee in the in the 1810s and 20s, uh, who was one of these people who was out digging up things and finding things, but he understood um, that circumstances on the frontier meant that it was very very difficult to, to keep the things that were discovered in a way, to preserve them in a way that would, that would you know, make them accessible to, to future generations. He says, it is to be regretted that these ancient ruins and relics have been exposed to so much depredation. Um, and he uses a term that I think um, is, is evocative. Valuable artifacts are lost by being found. In other words, things were discovered and because of the, the again, the lack of infrastructure, because of the impermanence of everything on the frontier, um, they, they couldn't be kept. And I would say that of all of the artifacts that we know of, that have been, were, you know, were referred to, were documented, et cetera, that were of significance to American archaeology in uh, prior to the Civil War, almost none of them survived. All gone, lost in one way or another. Um, 
And so our, their, their legacy for us is entirely in, in the kind of um, references that I've been using here, rather than actually, and so no one can go and look and open a cabinet and, and learn about the train idle because this is, this is what we've got. So yeah, I'm I'm probably pushing our time limit here. So let me let me bring it to a conclusion. Um, the story of the Triune Idol and many other things. I in the in this image here, you'll see a famous archaeological site called the Grave Creek Mound, um, which uh, will be the subject of a very similar story to uh, the Triune Idol. In fact, just two weeks ago, I got an email from a guy who's the director of the museum at the Grave Creek Mound in uh, Mound, West Virginia, who wanted to talk about uh, talk about ancient you know, early archaeology and ancient sites. And so the Grave Creek Mound, at least, is, is still there, unlike many other ones. Um, almost all of it, however, is gone. So one might ask, OK, well, so so where does that leave us? What's the what's the value of it? The value to me is the is simply the intense activity that was associated with finds of this kind. And I think we might agree that it seems rather remarkable that, you know, dozens, if not more than that, of, of average people um, out in, in Ohio and West Virginia and Tennessee. You know, even farther to the West, prior to the Civil War, are, are, are really devoting a lot of time and attention to, to Native American antiquities. Um, William Henry Harrison wrote a book, President Harrison wrote a book about the mounds of the Ohio Valley. How many presidents of the United States did you know of that wrote books about archaeology? Uh, and yet that was just one of, one of many. So when we are thinking about the history of American archaeology, it's my contention that delving deeply into the archives and, and our whole newspapers and all this other evidence um, that documents how engaged average people were in the antiquities that were turned up by every pass of the plow or every sort of a, of a spoonful of or spadeful of dirt that's turned over, that our history as a discipline, as a practice, archaeology in the United States is far more relevant to me to think about this intense activity as being um, the ancestor of what we do today than any kind of intellectual achievements. Thanks very much. And now that I've bludgeoned everyone into a, into a, a coma, uh, happy to take on questions I'll, I'll check the chat in a second, but questions from non, <laughs> questions that people like to deliver directly. Well, I, um, I, I don't have a question. Hmm. Um, I, I'm just struck by the, um, The complete um, disregard for the real native indigenous peoples of this land, you know, starting immediately as soon as they were pr pretty much exterminated, you know, then then suddenly their artifacts were considered to be curious and people couldn't wait to connect them with some civilization, some other part of the world that would you know, shine um, some kind of a light on uh, the new United States to to make it seem, uh, you know, I don't know what. <laughs> no, thank you. I, I get thank you. That that was just fascinating in in the, in the creepiest way. <laughs> yeah, it's, and I I should say that that it, it, it is really fascinating to, to delve into this and that 
the a lot of these commentators weren't oblivious to Native American history per se. Um, but there, there was a fairly profound, there was a perception of a profound difference between Native American history and antiquities. And, and it's, an, it's interesting to see how this, you know, how they discuss this, because it's it sort of, there's a struggle that goes with this. And people are saying, well, Indians were here um, and we know about them. And depending on the commentator, they were more or less interested in that story. Um, but, and yet they were really reluctant. I mean, a lot, some of them would say, yeah, okay. Um, Native people, Indians were here, and um, this is their history, and fine. Yeah, fine. No, no controversy, right? But but and many others are saying, yeah, but they don't make pottery like this. You know, they didn't make pottery this way. So if they didn't make pottery this way, this is somebody. They were they're very quick to say, this must be somebody else, you know? Um, and and but that didn't necessarily, I mean, we have this thing about like the mound builders and locked races and things like that. It's it's not clear to me that they were that, that everybody agreed that that the archaeology these antiquities were somebody else right some mysterious other other outfit although that absolutely does happen um, it was the, it was this idea that they, they saw a disconnect between what could be demonstrated historically and what they were digging out of those mounds and rather than uh, say okay then this is just history right these, these people we our history has changed we don't look like romans or greeks or whatever um they 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 struggled with that and i think i think the their general disinterest in native peoples um meant that they were very prone to saying okay it couldn't have been them we know who it was but it couldn't have been them uh even though that there were there were people who said no, of course it was them. You know, it wasn't the Welsh people or Phoenicians sailing over. Or I mean, even at the time, there's a lot of this. Like, no, that stuff is crazy. It had to be, um, it had to be Native American. Um, but that gets you know, the the, the 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 disconnect is real. If they're going like, like, okay, how do we get from the Triune Idol to um, to Algonquian speaking um, people that would have been in Northern Ohio and in people would have known about and they they didn't they, they often just didn't even try to bridge that gap i'm going to look at a couple of a uh, couple of the things in the uh in the chat yeah it is the Antiques Roadshow thing. Question is, it's uh, also by Marilyn. Antiques Roadshow of today is, is in line with inheritance from the antiquarian entrepreneurs. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, it's it, it is it, it's quite fascinating. People that find something in their closet and then try to try to sell it somewhere, try to make it make it deal. Um, as as John notes here, but before I was sort of building up to it, it. We would like to imagine that some of these artifacts and things are are available for for the study today, but they're but they're not. There were a few things that Thomas Jefferson got early on in the in actually in the eighteenth century um, that were in his collection. Some of which we mostly don't have. Uh, there are a few things at the at the Harvard Peabody Museum that, that were uncovered during this time. Of but of course, the archeological significance of these things is really hampered by the fact that we've got no provenience for them at all. I mean, you know, in the, in the case of this particular artifact, it's like somewhere in the Cumberland River. And because somebody in 1823 said, yeah, I think it was on the Caney branch over there. Really? Well, there's a lot of archeology span out there. We don't know. So, so it, it is striking how the literal legacy of, of this early archaeology um, is has vanished. Archaeological sites are a different story, but they're also neglected. I mean, these guys at the uh, at the Great Creek Mound Museum, um, you know, which is the Great Creek Mound is a, a marvelous, remarkable place. Um, but not many archaeologists 
take the 10 mile drive south of Wheeling, West Virginia um, to get down there and see it, right? Um, it's sort of forgotten and, uh, and marginal in many ways. One of the things I'd like to do someday is get someone to pay me enough, get a grant enough to do this and to make a trip up the Mississippi and on the Ohio and just go and see places where there used to be famous archaeological sites. Um, and, and, you know, that have been, were obliterated long ago. Um, I'm not quite sure what I would learn about that, but, I, but that strikes me as kind of an interesting, interesting field trip. Because there are, I mean, there are many. When people talk about, um, you know, mounds like the mound, the Monk's Mound at Cahokia, which is the largest earthen structure north of, north of Mexico, um, you know, Cahokia, there were, there were others that were, if not quite as big as Monk's Mound, pretty darn close. Um, um, and that made it, some of them made it all the way into the 1930s before they got torn down. Um, but on they are. And that's, that is, as, uh, as Marilyn says in the chat, that's, that's, that's sad and, and shameful. James, I, I had a comment, not a question. Sure. I was chuckling at the story of, of trying to, um, offering to buy and donate the collection in exchange for a professorship and thinking about more recent uh, <laughs> cases here in town. Yeah, yeah. Nothing has yeah. changed. Nothing has changed. And that, 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 I think that's part of the, the, what, what draws me to this is that, you know, everybody's trying to make a buck and everybody's trying to make it work. And, uh, and it, it's, and, and they're not necessarily greedy. They just, they've got to, uh, they got to live, right? They got to live. And it's, uh, you know, it's fine to be out there on the frontier, like, you know, rec recording weird, strange birds and weird archeological sites and things. But, you know, if you, no one's going to pay you for it, you got to, there's a, there was an episode that happened in the, in the 18, late 1830s. Um, a guy who worked was in one of these antiquarian circles in the in Mississippi, and he there's a a, a mound there that today we call I don't know if anybody's ever seen the Emerald Mound, but it's on the Natchez Trace outside of, of Natchez, Mississippi, which is a huge, big, amazing late Mississippian structure. One of one of the really remarkable archaeological sites, and they were worried in the 1830s that it would get plowed away. And so they sent an emissary to Philadelphia who gave a, gave a pitch to the American Philosophical Society that said, hey, don't you think this is important? And don't you think that, um, that, you, know, that, that you guys can do something about this? And they said, you know, we're not looking for money, but, but it'd be nice to have like a statement from you saying how important it would be that would like we can impress upon the landowner so he doesn't plant too much cotton on this mound and um and and they they basically said how very interesting we'll have to think about that say have you found any fossils down there um and, and the the guy basically said uh do you want to hear about fossils okay i'll tell you about fossils um because he was like going with the flow, right? He goes, okay, if you're not going to help us pr preserve this site, what, what what can we tell you that is interesting to you, right? That might, you know, that might attract your attention and might, you know, and talk about fossils and, and the weather and various kind of other things. But th they weren't, there was no, there was no, even though people were saying, hey, we could preserve these sites with a little input. Um, it never happened, and mostly because there was no precedent for doing that. I mean, these guys in the Philadelphia are saying, "Wait, you you want to you want to do what? You want to save save a, a mound? I mean, it's interesting, and that that, but but we've never done that before. Is there a, you know, um, and, and so it, and so they didn't, and in that case, that particular mound um, was big enough, was, was big enough, and sort of out of the way enough so that it got preserved, but. Many, many, uh, almost all of the others were uh, were plowed away at one time or another. Okay. I'm I am really struck, and 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 this is one reason why I appreciate the chance to talk about this. 
I am really struck by the, the local constituency here. I mean, it's basically folks are saying, hey, this is right down the road from us, or this was excavated from somewhere around here, or this is, this is important for us. So somebody help us save it. Um, and almost every time that, that it didn't work. The museums get set up and they go bankrupt. And then the things get sent to some museum somewhere else and they go bankrupt. And the, the archaeological site is fine until the, it gets sold to somebody else who plows it away because it's, you know, they can't plant tobacco on there. So you know, it's just the, the loss is absolutely staggering. But it's not for lack of interest. It's for, for lack of a mechanism to make it happen. James, um, is your book for sale on Amazon? Yeah, it absolutely is. Yeah. It absolutely is. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 it was the last time I checked. Um, the, 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 this is published through Oxford University Press, and, and they're they're kind of it's sort of a, a kind of a highfalutin operation, and they don't keep in close touch. <laughs> but uh, but I think it's there. And if 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 people can't find it and you want a copy, email me, and I'll be happy to uh, I'll be happy to broker it. Uh, and I should say, I'm glad you mentioned this, Joe. I should say that um, it you know, depends on people's tolerance for archaeological history, but but I, I I try to write these things in a way that that is not completely off-putting for for people outside of academia. Okay, so uh, um, it it the plan was to write something that people could could read and, and not not you know chuck it out the window. Um, in in despair so uh so I, i'm hoping that that's actually the case so you know if you need some help i'll be happy to do it thanks to john says he's just back and it's on amazon so so for them okay well we we thank you so very much i'm i want to hey send you this certificate of appreciation you'll get that in the mail soon and um i just want to announce for uh for next month May, we're going to have back with us Lauren Biltman, Amy Montenegro, and Paul Langenwalter. And the title of their talk is Local Investigations at, at CAORA 423, a multi component site in Lower Aliso Viejo Creek drainage in Orange County, California. So hopefully, um, anybody who can. Um, uh, attend personally, please do. You can see how lonely Stephen Dwyer and Stephen O'Neill look back there. We need to give them some company. So hopefully we can get back out of out of the COVID um, comfort and come back into the room. We could use your your bodies. Thank you. Uh, is there anything else that I forgot, or is there anything else that needs to be said? If not, I'm going to thank Dr. Sneed. Thank you very much tonight. It was wonderful. Everybody go out and buy his book. And um, I, I, I hope everybody has a safe and, and quick ride home. Thank you very much. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Um, this is Steve again, uh, Steve O'Neill. I might add that <clears throat> we will definitely have an in-person speaker next month. Um, Dr. Langenwalter is a regular attendee, actually, of the, uh, the, the talks here at the community room. He's with us this evening, and so he is someone who will be with us next month. So we encourage people to come and hear the talk in person. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much, Stephen, and Dr. Dr. Sneed. Good night. We're going to plug as much as we can plug it.